you for this time together. We know uh, how important our relationship <coughs> is. We just pray that we can stay consistent and stay steady. And we just want to come and grow in love towards you more and more every day. We just ask for concentration today and guidance in your word. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So we left off with Job 38, 1 through 3 here. And this is the part um, where Job is kind of being snapped back into reality, I guess you could say. Um, the Lord is actually speaking and he told him to brace himself like a man. He says, I will question you and you will answer me. And remember the word he used is to, that Job has been concealing his plan. And we kind of started talking about your witness and your example that you set to uh, believers around you. And it's one of those things that's easy to let slip because some people we're very comfortable around. Um, and, and what tends to happen in that position is your, your maybe your witness or your uh, uh, consistency in, in your spiritual life can tend to fall by the wayside because you are comfortable and you're not in the stage that you were, let's say, around a group of people that you may not know as well. So just keep that in mind as we go forward. But that's not the case with Job. Uh, he knew these people, at least as far as we can tell. Um, they are called three friends. And so needless to say, Job is obscuring and he's not being very accurate in his presentation of who God is. Uh, remember, we have many verses, but one of them is uh, Second Corinthians, it says, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That's interesting. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. Now, the context here is salvation, but I might add it doesn't make a difference that God is making an appeal through you. That's through you, literally. Uh, the word appear, uh, appeal, we've looked at this, means to call alongside. So God is calling others along His side through you, through your witness, through how you, what you do, what you say, and that all goes back to what you think. So we have to keep that in mind. So if we're gonna call anyone, if God is gonna call anyone alongside through you, we have to be on board in that process. We've gotta be that example and that witness that you're called to be. So uh, does accuracy matter here? It does, it very much does when you're setting the example. You know, looking back on your own life, we've all had examples that have encouraged or showed us the right way to go, whether it be a parent, a friend, a family member. There's someone in your life that you saw that has gotten you to where you are now. Somebody in your life has drawn you closer to this point of faith in your life. Those are the kind of people that we want to be. We want to be a positive encouragement, a positive influence. And it reminded me of uh, Proverbs 22, 6 that says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. That doesn't mean he will not depart. Um, but it does mean that when we are influenced in a proper way, in the right direction, and that is consistent, whether it be by a friend, a coworker, a parent, guess what? You've done your job. That's the Christian witness. That's the example that we set. And that's what the, the, the meaning of this is because you're drawing them. And really God is the one that's responsible for the drawing. It's not the fact that I am 
persuasive or that I have some personality or you have some personality. It's because God, the Holy Spirit, is empowering you to set that example. That's the only example we can set is the one that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we don't want to be a part of it. We don't want to set it because then it includes me. And I don't have anything good to offer you. So uh, it's easy to overlook the fact of how and why you got to where you are today. But there, you know, you don't just start off positive. You don't start off faithful. You're here from people in your life that have influenced you, whether it be small, whether it be big. Um, and it's probably many people, to be honest with you. And that include that encouragement with God's guidance in just life circumstances. You know, there's a common a combination of things just we're being, you know, that are coming at us. You've got God working through people and you've got God working through circumstances and he's working on us. And all these things are coming together and he's gotten you to this place where you are. Um, so he always gets the credit in in that drawing effect that's getting you closer to him. And so all of this go, really goes back to what I mentioned the other day about living out our position in Christ. Are we consistent in the walk when it comes to our witness and representation of God's character? Um, and really, the majority of people you come in contact with need some encouragement in this area or need to be drawn in the right direction. Most of them that you come into contact with or talk on the, to on the phone or text message or email, a lot of these people need that little bit of drawing effect and allow God to work that out in your own life. But you can only do that by setting the example and doing what we're saying here is being consistent. Um, w when you think about the, the immature believers, um, a lot of people are just living life. And they're just searching for happiness. That's really what it boils down to. So the fact that you are locked into the only true source of that happiness, maybe you can assist them in finding or guiding or directing them to what actually is important. Not just a search for happiness, not just to live a great life, not just to make a lot of money, because you will continue to go down that path of the search. And that's really what it boils down to. It's a search. But why not start with the happiness, the source of happiness, and then build? Because then you see how you're reversing, you're not getting the cart before the horse. You've put the source of the happiness first, your spiritual life is intact, and now you can let God build. Let Him show you the direction. Let Him prosper you. Let Him move the pieces, chess pieces in your life to get you where you need to go. Completely different mindset instead of you know, we're free Americans and we can go be what we want to be and I'm going to do the one, be the one to do that. Well, you know, kind of cart before the horse right there. So you have an impact in showing people that the only thing that matters in our lives is the word. That's it. That's it. I don't know where we'd be without it. And you have to remember that that what Job did, he, he misrepresented here, but our mission and Job's mission is much bigger than to misrepresent or to be selfish where we take matters into our own hands and we make maybe a mistake when it comes to our example. There's a lot bigger picture around us when it comes to other people. That effect is, is really big. So... And the last thing we need to do is conceal or misrepresent our God who we worship and love. Um, the funny thing is that all Job really wanted to do was plead his case before God, remember? Instead, he 
what he did was he exposed and he misrepresented God. He exposed himself. He exposed that pride, that, that arrogance that we don't want. And so God was just sitting and listening. And he finally responds to Job, but probably not the response Job was looking for. But uh, he did respond. Now, what he does respond with is pretty intense. The Lord asked, responds to Job in 70 questions, back to back, or, yeah, 70 questions. It takes up about two or three chapters of questions that the Lord is asking Job, and Job replies twice in here. I mean, from various things about nature, science, animals, creation events, space, the sky, the earth, all kinds of things the Lord is questioning Job about. And can you imagine what he's thinking? He's probably not thinking what he was thinking before he got to this point when God is questioning him. Because remember, his questions are being answered with questions. God is basically responding by asking is what he's doing. Questions with questions. Well, let me show you what a real question looks like so I can adjust your mind. Is actually what he's doing is he's enforcing humility into him by asking him questions, trying to make him see who God is. And just by God is the one who's asking these questions. He's probably just sitting there wide eyed and he just doesn't know what to say. I mean, what do you say? To, we'll, we'll look at some of these, what God is asking him. He's probably dumbfounded, though. He's got his tail between his legs at this point. So, you know, I mean, you can't really do anything. He said just brace himself like a man and listen while God is instilling some humility. So uh, let me give you some examples of what God says here. Some of these would be great questions for this unbelieving science community, too, to maybe look into. Uh, this God said, the Lord says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wickedness out of it? Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked to the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of, the, of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Where does light and darkness reside? And can you take them to their places? Have you seen the storehouses of the snow or the hail, which I reserve for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Can you bring forth the constellations and their seasons? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do you report to, do you report to you? Here we are. Who gives the rooster understanding? Of course, I like that one. I, I like <laughs> chickens. So, uh, see, some of you didn't realize that roosters have understanding, but they do have understanding. One thing that they understand is that they need to protect those ladies that they're with. That's the one thing that I've learned about a rooster. They, they, they do a good job at it, too. They protect those hens and they actually look out for them and they can see really, really far, too. Um, so then in chapter 39, the Lord continues asking Job questions in chapter 39. And I don't know if I have a slide uh, for that. Yep. It says the wings, uh, this is interesting. He's speaking about animals now and listen to this. The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, though they cannot compare with the wings of the or the wings and feathers of the stork. She lays her eggs on the ground and lets them warm in the sand, unmindful that a foot may crush them, that some wild animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly as if they were not hers. She cares not that her labor was in vain, for God did not endow her with wisdom or give her a share of good sense. (laughs) Yet when she spreads her feathers to, to run, she laughs at horse and rider. 
So it's interesting how God is describing these things. And it makes you realize that not only does he create, but he limits or gives understanding and wisdom to whatever degree everything is at. And I wanted to see, because I read this and I thought, wow, this stork is something else. So I looked it up and man, they are really not that bright. I mean, there's, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of, uh, you can look it up yourself, but they, I mean, you can see them tossing their babies out of the nest, killing them, trying to chomp on them, eat them, step on them. Um, I mean, they're just, there's something else. I mean, some of the babies make it, but they're just, they don't seem that bright. That's why I understood when it said they, they uh, their labor, she cares not that her labor was in vain. That's true. She doesn't seem to understand or care what she's destroying or what she's doing. Uh, but God has designed everything with a certain amount of, of understanding and wisdom. So, and you can remember before Job got to this point, he had big hopes. He had big hopes to present. He wanted to talk to God. He wanted to present his case um, that he was blameless, that he was right before God's eyes. But now he doesn't have anything to say. His hopes to present his case and debate are completely gone. They're gone. You could say this is subjective subjectivity turned instantly to objectivity instantly just by God asking him questions and this is, brings up a point that since God has his own ways and I think this is kind of what he was showing Job his own designs his own purposes in our world in you in the universe in nature um, in dealing with people that doesn't mean that we have to be explained the details of that just because of who God is. He was trying to present Job to show him how powerful he is in the fact that he is a perfect God and he does rule. But he doesn't. And, and just because of that one fact means that we should be able to trust him with the details. We don't have to be explained on why God does what he does in our lives just because of who he is. Because he's God. He's a perfect God. And a perfect God can only make perfect decisions. So part of this, I think the part of the lesson is to realize that we don't have to have answers to life's questions that we're left with. Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Because you can get really angry if you stay on that path of God, why did this happen? You just have to trust in God and his character, in who he is, in the fact that he is perfect and he does love you. That's part of his essence, isn't it? And he is righteousness and justice. So he's going to make a decision that is perfect. And he's always looking out for our benefit. And we just have to have faith. That's what part of the Christian life is all about. Not about questioning. It's about believing in the God you serve. And part of service means taking orders and carrying them out. And that's the, 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 the most faithful, I think, thing we could do as Christians is taking our orders from the word and carrying them out. That's faithful. That's a believer that is motivated by the word and by who God is and, and believes the truth, believes who God is and wants to see that happen so they don't question. They may have questions in their mind trying to figure these things out. We all do. But the point about it is they don't question the character. They don't question why he's doing it or why did he do it this way? Or, you know, I could question the stork. Why, why did he, you know, it's, there's a lot of things we can question, but there is a reason for it. There's probably a million reasons why that stork is not the smartest bird and we just won't know them all until we get to heaven and those things might even affect us here even though we don't have storks around here who knows i mean we don't know the details but we know that god knows and he created these things with a purpose and that purpose is eternal and perfect have you ever watched nature 
I mean, you got to wonder how these things work. I mean, I'm fascinated with insects. I mean, some of these bugs, I mean, they are just amazing to me. How they work, how they communicate, how they, you know, how they, you ever seen a praying mantis look at you like a person? I mean, what do they see? What are they looking at, you know? Just ants communicate, following each other. They all help each other. They work all day. Do they sleep? I mean, these things are questions that hopefully we can have an answer to because I would like to know. So we definitely see Job is uh, probably just backpedaling at this point. Um, but God is just showing him that he doesn't need to explain anything. And he doesn't need to explain anything to us because of who he is. Um, and, and this is the, really, I think, the underlying question of this thing about Job and us and our faith is this is the God we believe in. And just being able to see and witness his creation should be eye opening to us. It should be eye opening. And at the same time, as we go through life, that's, on not, that's just part of it. You know, that's a small part. But as we go through life and we're unsure, we get worn down, we have weaknesses, we're fearful, we're nervous, or some dilemma that's, you know, we frequently find ourselves in, we have to ask ourselves in every one of these situations, is God capable? Because that's what God is trying to tell Job. He's saying, am I capable? And then he asks him all these questions that are saying that he's infinitely capable. He created the earth. He created us. He created the human body. I mean, that's a whole different subject, right? How does the brain work? How does the heart work? It doesn't take gasoline. I don't know how it keeps going. But it goes. So is God capable if he can do all these things? Is he capable with Job's problem? Is he capable with our problems in suffering? Yes, he is. He's very capable. In other words, is he capable to finish what he started? He designed it and he put it all into motion. Think about that. There was nothing and then there's something and here we are and he's putting it into motion. And it's got purpose behind it. And Satan's part of that purpose. And so are you. The good and the bad are part of this purpose. Even though God didn't create that, he knew it was going to happen. Free will. So Isaiah 14, 27 says, For the Lord of hosts has planned. He's planned. This word is in the perfect tense, which means the decisions and the plans have already been made. They've already been made. The deals have been sealed. Everything is just playing out like a record right now to God. This is already something that he knows about and he's been knowing about for eternity. It says he's planned and who can frustrate it? That means that, in other words, no one can change any of God's plans. No one can thwart his plan. No one can change no, God did not explain his ways to Job, but he showed him through questions by explaining to him of who he was. And this is showing us that if we are going to be on board with that plan, with this path in our life, no one can change that. No one can stop that. No one can frustrate that. He's the sustainer of the universe. And he doesn't owe us an explanation. So, and actually this, we can call it a, a confrontation, I guess, between God and Job is the longest recorded one by God himself in the Bible. And here's Job's first response in humility. First, chapter 40, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Job, uh, will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer him. 
Then Job answered. He finally answers three chapters later. He says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am in, I'm insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. Once I have spoken and have no answer, and I have no answer, even twice, and I will add nothing more. So you can definitely hear from Job's response that he just got roasted. You can hear it. I mean, he, he's in a completely different place. He is, you can tell that he's had a change of mind. He, he's in a different place than he was before. And he's, you know, he's come to an understanding, I guess we could say. So then the Lord just proceeds, uh, proceeds to humili humiliate Joel. He says, then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. And he says it again, brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. So he continues the same thing. But now the questions become more intensified. He's kind of throw. He, first, he's talking about things that Job is kind of, you know, very distant. But now listen to what he says. Some of these things that he says. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's and can your voice thunder like his? So now he's saying, OK, it's me and you now. I'm not talking about what I created or the things that I did. I'm directly referring to you and me. So he's probably shaking in his boots right now. I don't know how you would reply. Of course, we can see how Job replied. He didn't most of the time. So the Lord continues questioning Job in chapter 41. And this is kind of widening the gap between what our power is and what God's power is. That's what God's kind of doing to Job. He's widening that gap. What's in Job's control and what's in God's control. And I think Job understands that. And that really makes sense because when, even when we think something is in our power, it's not. It's really not. Because everything on this earth includes the things you have around you and life itself. So we really don't have any control when we think about it like that. When we think about who's really in control. It can all be taken away and we have no power to stop it. So instead of fighting things in life that we have no control over, we have a God that allows us to go with the grain, to go with him, to not fight and question and ask to go with him. And he wants to take us all with him. And he's trying to do that with Job. Don't work and fight against yourself. So, and then we see Job's second reply. Here's his second reply. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things. And that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. There's that word, thwarted. So he's, he's, now he's, he's speaking the truth now. He's setting the example again. So he goes from speaking lies to speaking. He's telling the truth. This is true. God can do all things. Now that should be reminding you of another verse. So... I can, I know that God can do all. He says, I know that you can do all things. And that should be reminding you of Philippians 4.13. When Paul says, I can do all things through Christ. Through Christ. A little different, but same concept. Just said differently, isn't it? And what's the context there? And what is Paul referring to? How about life in general? Listen to what he's talking about in the verse before it. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having an abundance and suffering need. So when we think about all things here, this is life itself. Not just that God can do, will do, and he ultimately is. That is true. We're talking about us, people, 
going through life and allowing God to do it for us. He's the one who's working on your behalf. It's not you. We have, we're powerless. Think about what we just talked about. The ostrich or the, uh, the stork. I mean, we're powerless. And we just don't know. But God does know. So, uh, the externals, we have to always remember, aren't the issue here. Uh, what is the issue, and even in Job's case, or in our case, is that we can do all things within this fallen world because God gave us the option to live it in Christ. That's why we can do all things, because we can live it in Christ. That's what you have available. But you have to know and understand that, too. That's part of the Christian growth, the spiritual life. Because if you don't understand that, what you will do, you will find yourself doing, is you will continually trust in the things that you can see, which include yourself and the things in this world. God is showing us right here that we don't trust the things we can see because you will place that priority over truth and the reality that you can do all things. That's what happens. We can do nothing. We talked about that. But only through Christ, not through yourselves, not through other people, not through better circumstance, not through being healthy, but through Christ. That's what it says. Those other things may supplement, but they're not the source. They're not the source. And Job is just now realizing that. He's understanding the power, the perfection of God that he has on his side. And you have it on your side. This is what we have. The God that created these things that we go outside and say, how? How? Why? And we just laugh because it's really we can't figure it out. That's who we have on our side. If you want to really be discouraged in life, then start to think about your own plans. That's how you can be discouraged. Because there's a lot of questions, there's a lot of doubts, there's a lot of discouragement in my plans that I think I have for myself. That's discouraging. But it just said that God's plans will not be thwarted. Do you see the difference? There's two different realities that we can live on this earth. It's my reality or it's the reality that's true and real and is God's. I can live in a false concept of what it's supposed to be. God will allow me to do that. But it's not the truth. It's either living a lie or it's living by the word. That's the only options that we have. So God's purposes, the word thwarted here means that God's purposes will never be withheld, cut off, made inaccessible, distracted from, weakened, or anything else. They're just there. And we come somewhere in there, either we want to be on board. It's like a train moving, right? Either you grab it and you go, or you just watch it go by. There's two things, but when you grab it, you're on it. And as Christians, we want to be to the point where you can't jump off. It's going too fast. You're at a point now where you just, you thought you could get off earlier. Yeah, you thought about that a while back, but now, no. And that's a good place to be. Because now you're moving fast, you're moving towards your destination. And we're all citizens of heaven. We're moving in that direction. So that's encouraging. That's encouraging. So when you think about all these words, talking about plans being cut off, not made accessible, distracted from, weakened, or anything else, that's what happens to our plans, isn't it? All those things that I just mentioned that don't happen to God's, they do happen to ours. They get frustrated. They get distracted from. They get weakened. They get made inaccessible. They get cut off. I mean, think about the things that we've planned in our lives that just haven't come to anything. That's because we weren't being guided. We weren't doing it through Christ as we should have been. We weren't focused and we didn't have him as our priority. That's the only problem there. 
Otherwise, we wouldn't have been frustrated. We would have been on board with what he chose, not with what I chose. We have to be humble enough to see what God is doing in your life. And if you can see that, if you can say, okay, this is a very bad thing and it stopped me dead in my tracks, but I know that it's, a, it's not what I'm supposed to do. It's God showing me that there's another way, another direction, and I need to respond. Response of the Christian is so important. That's huge. We've got to respond to what God does in our lives. And that response includes beating the flesh down or you're not going to be able to respond. You can't do it. All you can respond to is your sin nature. You've got to maintain this humility consistent in the word. Consistency. So, and that goes back to why our plans, any, our, any plans that you get, they may be innocent, they may not be innocent, but any plans that you get, they've always got to be made secondary to what God may have in store for you. You've always got to bounce these things off, right? We always say that when we pray. Let's go in it prayerfully. There's a reason we do that as a church body when we make decisions with the deacons or with anything. There's a reason we pray because we're trying to let things fall out and show and let God allow us to see a better path. That maybe that isn't always an option. That's OK. But what I'm telling you is there's a reason why you move slowly and not fast, because God will show you. But you have to be open to it. You have to be willing to see it and open to recognizing it and then making a decision off of that. Because there's so many times where we make decisions and it ends up being a really bad decision. And it could be a really it could be financially. It could be with friends, family or, or something of that nature that really has a bad effect on it. But but it seemed innocent here. It just seemed like a, a plan, a great plan that I had. When we go about these things on our own, that's when we get into an area where God may make an abrupt change. And he's just showing us that, OK, I'll let you go down that path long enough. You had enough fun. Now I want you to be in reality. I want you to be doing what I've gifted you to do. I want you to be I, I've designed you. I've created your brain. I know what you like. I want you to see what I had for you was a lot better than what you thought you were supposed to have. It's not about all these things you were thinking. It's about what God already knows, but he doesn't have to explain that to us. It goes back to what we just talked about. It goes back to trusting him and walking in that direction, walking in the spirit. And that is why if you keep our desires and plans secondary to God's authority and seek to serve him and be obedient to what he desires, then we can enjoy life. We can really enjoy because the plans aren't thwarted. And you're a part of that. He's letting us have, he knows what you enjoy. Guess what? You're going to like this verse. And is, hold on, we're not there yet, but isn't that what really what capacity is all about? The more capacity you have, then the more capable you are to keep God first in your life, no matter what. That's what capacity is. You want a billion dollars? Have capacity for it. You want a new venture, a joint business? You want a new bit? Have capacity for it. What do you want? Have capacity for it. Whether good, bad, suffering or not is not the issue. If God is first in your thoughts and actions, then Psalm 37.3. Don't worry, all hope is not lost. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourselves in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Do you see that? He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. That's what it's telling us. It's telling us that he will do what we desire, what you like, what you desire in your heart. We just have to be on board and trust him to guide us through the way. This is what it's all about. This is what Job, the book of Job is all about. It's about trusting. 
that's encouraging and motivating. And would you believe that even though it includes you and what you desire, you don't even have to know the details of it? You don't. You don't. Because he already knows on top of all that. He knows what you like and what you want and what you desire. It's really about his timing. And I know that's a hard part of it. It's about his timing. It's about trusting in that timing. But that's part of it. That is part of it. God has us in a certain place in our life to build us to that point to be able to bless you. He enjoys doing that more than you can enjoy the blessing. But he's got to have you in a spot where you're not pulling a job. Where you get in that suffering and it's taking too long to get out of. You've got to have that endurance to do what this verse is saying. Cultivate faithfulness, trust in the Lord, do good, all these things. Commit your way to the Lord and he will do it. There's no doubt. Our job is really kind of easy when you think about committing your way to the Lord and trusting him in him. We don't have to plan. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. While staying stressed out about it, doing it the whole time. We, we don't have to do that. It's been done. Just trust. Just trust the plan. Trust in the plan. So that's probably a good place to pick up next time. And then I'll just read this verse where we'll pick up next time. It says, this is Job. He's still speaking, responding. He says, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I've declared that which I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. So we just don't know and we don't need to know. We just need to trust. Trust God because he's always looking out for your best interest. Believe it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, just an amazing plan that even though we have no clue what you're doing, we can trust that you're making perfect and right decisions on our behalf. And we don't deserve that, but we know you're doing it and we can trust you. We want to live a life that is pleasing, that is glorifying to you and just that m helps go in the right direction. We want to be on the train and we want to just watch and enjoy the scenery and watch you work. We thank you so much for everything that you do and thank you for this beautiful weather. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.